Coming up, we are going to take a look at where things might stand with where the Nets could draft coming in to next week, taking a look at a bunch of different mocks, where they have the Nets drafting, who they have them drafting, where the industry is starting to lend itself to consensus around these picks. We're going to break it all down right after the theme music. You are Locked On Nets, your daily Brooklyn Nets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, welcome back to the Locked On Nets podcast on the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team, the Brooklyn Nets, every single day. I am Doug Norrie. No Adam Arbrecht on the podcast today. It's all right. He's rocking with some really special guests later on in the week. Really, really excited about that one. That's okay. For today's show, we got plenty, plenty, plenty to talk about when it comes to Brooklyn Nets. And I'm fired up today because I was hanging out this afternoon. Old friend, old friend of the show, but old friend in real life, John Randolph, who it was just kind of brought back to my attention. This guy is just an absolute lifer Nets fan. We actually ended up that we were at a family party today, ended up talking Nets stuff for some of the day, a lot of the day. And it was just, I don't know, sometimes you want to talk Nets on the podcast. Sometimes you want to talk Nets in real life. So shout out lifer John Randolph back to the New Jersey days of uh, now Brooklyn Nets, but old school NJ Nets uh, fandom. And actually just talking about it all day at the party, ignoring the kids, ignoring the wife, you know, doing all the other stuff that you're not doing all the other stuff you're supposed to be doing at parties. That's all right, because it gets you fired up to talk nets. Can't forget either that this show is brought to you about our friends over at Prize Picks. First time users can receive 100 percent instant deposit match up to 100 dollars with promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com promo code locked on. All right. Tons to talk about today. Uh, Really over the weekend what we got into and I was getting excited about this because I was trying to like just sort of wrap my head around where things were going when it came to the Nets uh, and the draft, right? We've done a lot of draft analysis so far. We've gotten into sort of what's going on in terms of, you know, who's sort of landing in their range. We talked about a bunch of different guys so far, uh, just in terms of just breaking down who we thought would be good fits, who we thought might be more project territory who we were getting excited about who we kind of wanted to drop you know there's been a pretty wide range of different dudes that we've talked about who could or might land into the Nets territory and who could they end up could end up taking at picks 21 and 22 and it makes it even more exciting with the Nets this season as opposed to some other ones that they just have two picks in this draft right in the past we've wondered are they you know one do they have a pick two are they going to use their pick it's been uh, sort of hit or miss uh, in terms of those just areas when it comes to Sean Marks recently in the last couple of years when it comes to the draft. But landing on two picks that are back-to-back in this draft lends itself to a pretty unique situation where the Nets are concerned and a really exciting one to think about how sort of the future of this team can begin to or continue to be built out with the Nets as or excuse me, with the draft picks as part of of this scenario, right? They're picking back to back. Are they going to go? Are they going to go? You know, guys who are going to be able to help directly right now. They're going to go more project based and just sort of like drafting on upside for future seasons. Could they split the difference? Right? You pick twenty one and twenty two. Could you go one guy that helps now and one guy that's you know just the guy that you can dream the most in the future? The the picks in this range in this twenty one to twenty two range sort of land in one of those two areas, right? You've heard us talk a lot about the guys that are, that are here in these ranges, right? Is it going to be guys like, you know, Ryan repair who it's going to maybe take a couple of years. Is it going to be guys like Chris Murray, who might be like sort of NBA ready now, but like, it's hard to really view a ton of upside around those guys. And I think that's sort of where we end up landing with where the nets are now. So over the weekend, kind of tried to get a lay of the land and a sort of take stock of where the industry is calling or where the industry is landing uh, as far as where the nets are in in picks 21 and 22. And what you'll find and what we'll go over to in today's show is that it's kind of all over the place right now. I mean, there is. 
there's starting to be a little bit of consensus around who might be available and who might fit the bill for the Nets. We'll go through that uh, here shortly about all the different names. Um, and, you know, maybe things are starting to round out with about 10 days left to go until the draft about the kind of player the Nets might take and who might be available there. But what, what you see from looking around the industry right now from you know, really, really dialed in people uh, across the industry and locked on has uh, one of the best, or if not the best, you know, with, when it comes to Raphael Barlow and the NBA big board, like there is just a lot of information out there. There are a lot of experts that can just have figured this stuff out or just not even figured it out completely, but they are as dialed in as it can possibly get when it comes to who is going to land where and, you know, who's what team is going to take who based on talent, based on, just positions that teams might need based on how they've drafted in the past. Like we've seen how this can kind of go over the years. So over the weekend, took a look at where the, I went through a bunch of different mock drafts and started to analyze where the, you know, where the industry was coming to some kind of consensus around the nets. Took a look at really as, as many as we could bring up here, right? Like, ESPN, The Athletic, SB Nation, Yahoo, The Ringer, CBS, went through, I think, 16 total. I'm not going to list them all here uh, and not going to just like, go through you know, the, the process that each one of these uh, might go through. And, you know, maybe you have the different outlets that you trust a little bit more than others. Like I said, I think Locked On does it as good, if not that or does it as good as anybody in the industry right now. I mean, point stop. You got to go over and listen uh, to what our guys are doing here, just breaking down the draft leading into this thing. But, you know, you I think in these kind of situations, it does make sense to look around at a lot of different folks and a lot of different opinions, people that maybe have been doing this for a long time also, to look at, so, you know, where, who are the names that are cropping up the most? Who are the when we look at it enough, if we get a big enough sample size, let's say of mock drafts, who are the names that we see popping up the most times among industry leaders, among people that are doing this full time. And I think what we did, uh, you know, we definitely started to see more names coming up than others for sure. I'll get to those in one second. But when we, when I started to look at, you know, where this thing was landing it, we were talking about, a lot of different guys are landing in these ranges. As of right now, there were 16, no, excuse me, uh, 14 different players that different outlets had the Nets picking at either 21 or 22. 14 different guys. And that already feels like a lot. Like there's feels like a lot of different ways this could go come draft night. And it makes sense, right? Like this is th this part of the draft, like we said, is not definitely locked down yet. We're still a little bit of time. We'll do this exercise at least one more time before the draft as we get, you know, really close and really, really dialed in around where teams are going to go. And it's still, to some degree, this is going to have to still be solved on draft night. Like we're never going to be able to figure this whole thing out because, uh, you know, it's Victor Wembanyama at one and. Maybe it's going to be Scoot at two and Brandon Miller at three. And then I, I think as of right now, people still think after that, the draft is, and maybe those two and three even get switched, but that the draft is just really, really wide open right now in terms of like where uh, guys can go. And so when now when you get, the, when you iterate that all the way down to 21 and 22, the names, uh, you know, things can really, really get, it, it can just get pretty loose, right? Like there's going to be 13, 14, 15 guys that are mentioned in these ranges. So, we're going to show you um, where the graph ends up landing. I'll try to do this as best I can on uh, on the stream. It's uh, probably a little bit of formatting here, but that's just going to be the way that it goes. So if you look at where all the, the graph ends up landing, I'll show you this, then we'll hit a quick break, and then we'll kind of dive more into this. But you can see that the two biggest names that are featured for the Nets as of right now are Jed Howard and Gigi Jackson. I was a little bit surprised when it came to that these were ended up being not overall consensus. And again, it's still pretty spread out. You can see Jed Howard features in about almost 20% of mock drafts for the Nets. And then Gigi Jackson, decent far behind, decently behind him, but just under 14%. And then it gets really spread out as you go. But as it stands right now, Sunday night, June 11th, going into <laughs> June 12th for the episode, it looks like this is where things might be starting to round out for the Nets. Now, there's some players that are on this list that might be 
projected to be a little higher, so they don't come into the nets as much. You might maybe thinking like Leonard Miller when it comes to that. Maybe and there's some guys that have been just strictly one offs when it came to where the nets were going to draft. But right now, Jed Howard and Gigi Jackson are the two guys that are being the mentioned the most among the industry as it stands right now for the nets. And I think that's a pretty interesting kind of look at what could happen here in terms of Nets Nation and what could ultimately how the draft could end up playing out come draft night. We're going to get a little bit more of what that means, what we're looking at if, you know, if it were to be Jet Howard, if it were to be Gigi Jackson, go through some of the other names that are mentioned here in and around the Nets draft because I think this exercise does start to really dial us in about what could end up happening here in draft night. And like I said, what those two names specifically could mean for the Nets. We'll get into that in a second. First, this show is brought to you by better help right now. It can be tough trying to just figure out when to spend time on yourself. Like, right, you know, it's easy to get caught up in what everyone else needs from you. You're never taking a moment to think about what you might need from yourself. You just spend a lot of your time giving. It can make you feel really stretched in, maybe even burned out. Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Look, therapy is something that we can all need us from time to time. It could be great to talk to somebody. It can be great to sort of just let it out and figure out what you need for yourself and not always making sure that you're stretching yourself thin beyond to the point where you can't give to others. If you think if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. Entirely online. It's designed to be super convenient, flexible, suited to your schedule. All you do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash LockedOnNBA. Okay, so Gigi Jackson, Jet Howard are the two biggest names featured for the Nets as it stands right now. Just rolling through some of the other sort of popular names that were showing up. Noah Clowney showed up more times than some others. Derek Whitehead uh, was there a few times. Bryce Sensabaugh, uh, Ryan Repair was another guy. And then we had some one-offs, uh, Jamie Jokez. Ben Shepard mentioned a couple times. Jalen Hood, Maxwell Lewis, Leonard Miller. I think that was more of a, like a dropping in a particular draft, Kobe Bufkin, and then Chris Murray and James Najaji. There are so pretty wide range of names uh, in all things considered, but I did find it interesting that Jet Howard and Gigi were the two guys that showed up the most because I do think they represent sort of opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of what to expect here on draft night. And I actually do think to some degree they would be of the splitting the difference between like sort of maybe getting close to ready to play earlier than later. And that would be Jet Howard. And then more of a project sort of upside pick. And we'll try to figure out what's going on in Gigi Jackson. And I, I do, the more I think about it within, from the Nets perspective, I, I do start to wonder if that is like sort of the smart path. If they were to keep, if they, you know, first of all, if they were to keep both picks and that's looking, I think more and more like that's going to happen, that they're going to use both picks in this draft, but that, that, that kind of, um, I, I said, splitting the difference, that sort of strategy here around taking sort of maybe one guy for fit and one guy for upside would make sense with where they are in the draft and just sort of where they are in terms of overall team construction right now. And I think to some degree, like I said, Jed Howard and Gigi Jackson represent those two sort of paths. And I think that puts the Nets in an interesting situation about like how to best use this draft. If you look at Howard, we we didn't pre I encourage you to go back and listen to the episode that we already did on Jed Howard because we did talk about him at length as a reminder, right? Just coming out of Michigan, son of Jawan Howard, pretty tall dude, really pretty good shooter at the college level, could really pull up um, off multiple looks and be able to get into a shot. It's really kind of just the shooting for him uh, in terms of where he is right now for, from an NBA perspective, bombed a ton of threes in college, over seven three-pointers a game in thirty, uh, just under 32 minutes. Shot 37%, good free throw shooter when he actually got to the line, 80%. The form looks really good. You can really see, you can imagine a scenario pretty quickly around where Howard could translate at least that part of his game to the NBA level. He's not 
he's not blown by people off the dribble. It's not like people, uh, this is a dribble. I think it kind of threw a V in there. He's not blown by, by guys um, while he's on the ball. It's kind of hard, hard to imagine running like total pick and roll. He's more of like a wing guy, except that the defense isn't overwhelming. So I don't even know if you can really out of the box, call him a three and D guy, but I think the, the three point shooting would play from day one, at least. I think you at least have that. And that's a really pretty good place to start. We talked about it on the episode in the past, too. Like, I love when guys come with pedigree here, being the son of an ex NBA guy and playing for his dad at Michigan and Juwan Howard. I, that gets extra points for where I'm concerned. It just does. Like, the understanding the professionalism from day one about playing in the NBA means a lot. I think that ca- I think that counts for a lot, honestly. And so, in you know, not to give extra points. I guess I do just give extra points for having that happen because I think it's just sort of a baseline understanding of how things operate in the NBA means a lot when you're coming into the league. So getting Jed Howard here as a freshman coming out of, of Michigan, would he like, is he a starter day one? No, of course not. I don't think that's the case. Could he come in and contribute, hit some threes off the bench, be part of a second unit group that could maybe, you know, play you know, really well spaced floor. Yeah. I think you could begin to start to see something like that with him. So I, I, and I've, and I've heard from plenty of Nets fans, you know, already that this is a guy that they kind of would like to see show up day one or at the draft that Jed Howard is the kind of guy that probably would play that they liked the game that they saw from uh, at Michigan from him. And that if this was a guy that they called on draft night, that, And maybe this is also Nets fans like kind of talk or Nets folks kind of talking themselves into like, hey, this is a guy we're seeing show up in and around the draft right now. Right. I told you that this is a guy that shows up in more mock stuff than anybody else at this point. So maybe at some point you can just get used to seeing the name and that's what you like. It's what you kind of graft onto. That's what you start believing in. That's what you start picturing in terms of sort of Nets world wearing a Nets jersey. But I, I do think as much as like I'm not overwhelmed by Jed Howard's game, uh, I don't think it would be a bad pick. We said it at the time that I think that it would be, I think that's what we said. It was like it would be a fine pick, if not a total game-changing pick, but it's pretty safe. I think you know what you're getting. I think you are not trying to figure too much out on the fly with him and and kind of away you go. With Gigi Jackson, it's a different situation, right? Like he's he's in a situation where – it wasn't completely perfect here in South Carolina. Um, if the draft had been done a year ago, or if we, if we looked at what this draft class was maybe next year, if he hadn't reclassified, maybe he's sitting at the top. Like this was a guy that was at or near the top of a lot of stuff coming out of college. Just give me coming out of high school reclassifies, goes to South Carolina a little earlier than, or, or a year earlier than expected. And and from a physical gifted tool standpoint, I mean, this guy, Gigi Jackson ranks up there really with some of the best, right? He's a super huge dude of power forward. He can get it into off the dribble. He can score. It looks very projectable from an NBA perspective about like what he might be able to do. The body is almost definitely going to get there in terms of like, what an NBA player needs to do. So this wingspan's about seven feet. Like I said, three level score, with that frame is something that you can really start talking yourself into for his size and like his overall build, the ball handling is going to, if not all the way there, it's going to pretty much get there. And the footwork is, it looks pretty good. And he's super young. I, again, like this is a guy that is just not old. I think he's only 18 years old as we speak. Yeah. He's like, he's, he's in his eight, year, year 18. Now he won't even turn 19 until the season's well underway in December. But the concern with Gigi Jackson, as we've talked about on the podcast before, is that there's could be some maturity concerns. There could be some, you know, just overall, like, does he get it on a basketball court as like part of a team unit? Uh, It's like that was like pretty questionable in his time at South Carolina. Um, Did never wanted to pass. We talked about this in the times (laughs) that we talked about him. He averaged less than assist a game in 32 minutes. That is almost impossible to do if you are playing with four other players on the court at the same time. If it's a one-on-one game, yeah, I can see it like a 0.8 assist in 32 minutes. Um, or, you know, that maybe you don't, you never need to pass when there are four other players on the court with you during that time. Even if you're at a, 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 a unit, like he was playing with South Carolina. I mean, even then it's a pretty troubling number in terms of like how he was seeming to fit in overall team basketball. But again, is this a situation like where he was just kind of young and coming into a situation where 
he maybe just wasn't fully ready for it and he can just grow up over the next year or two or three and turn into and start like sort of realizing all the different basketball skills. I mean, at that point, if you feel like there is any chance that he can be able to do that, then being able to grab him at like this 21, 22 range may could make a lot of sense. If you believe in your player development thing, if you just feel like, Hey, this was maybe it was more about the situation and less about him. If you feel like, Hey, if this draft had been done again at a different time where he was just still sitting at the top of this draft class or excuse me, a year later, like you getting in just a year early on him and he shouldn't have, it just kind of didn't exactly work out of the college level. Then yeah, like I can understand why Gigi Jackson is a guy that is falling into this range and why people might be really excited about him. Cause we definitely heard from a bunch of folks that works when we did our Gigi Jackson episode last week that were or two weeks ago that were getting really, really excited about this guy's name being called not for the same reasons as Jez Howard, but because in terms of just overall complete and utter supernova upside, Hey, maybe he could have it. And I can definitely see that. Like I can definitely see the world where three years from now or something like that, we're looking at the situation of, Oh, like maybe they're saying to yourself, I can't believe Gigi Jackson lasted all the way to 21 or 22 because he does have those kind of physical tools. He does have that kind of overall makeup from a basketball perspective. He does have like just sort of a frame that you kind of want to just add to this. He had a frame plus the overall ball skills and scoring skills that you kind of in some ways dream on for players and hope that they end up falling to you. Maybe in your, in your, they're falling to you because there's other sort of problematic stuff. So when I talk when I talk about like why Jet How- why it's interesting about Jet Howard and Gigi Jackson is because this does go into what I was saying before about one guy ready maybe a little more ready now with that pedigree with that sort of maybe professionalism built in because of the family and I'm just project I'm definitely projecting some of that for sure like I don't you know I haven't done like a deep dive into the personality traits but from everything you read about Jet it looks pretty great on that end so yeah is there a little projection on my part for sure but hey that's just kind of what you have to do sometimes but that's like it represents a really safe pick right it's like a really it's safe we understand it we kind of know it we can take it out of the box and know what we're getting and that makes sense from a Nets, a Nets organizational standpoint that might be a little risk adverse right now, might not be wanting to just kind of go too nuts with who they're bringing in the door, want to keep it safe. Like I think that this they've kind of signaled a lot of this safety as an organization over basically, I mean, basically since uh, the trade, since shipping out Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving at the trade deadline. Like I think there's been a sort of like safe aspect to this team that they want to just maybe get back on a more professional. I wouldn't even call it professional, but just like sort of a track that is different than the Katie Kyrie and to a lesser extent, James Harden era, right? That's just different. That has a different feel, has a different overall tone. Um, just is just something different than what we've seen over the last couple of years. It's not like those guys weren't professionals necessarily, but there was just a certain different feel around this team. And I think if you've been following the Nets for a couple of years now, you kind of just know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I don't think I need to explain that in too, too much detail about what's going on when I, when I'm kind of talking about the overall vibe of this group over the last couple of years and got, drafting a guy like Jet Howard maybe represents that. But the cool thing about having 21 and 22 back to back here is, Hey, you go a little safe at the, the start maybe. And then you go with Gigi Jackson. If he's still there, or if you feel even a little bit comfortable about your player development, just track here going forward, because if you're still, if you're, and, it, and maybe that's what the Nets have sort of signaled from their, some of their recent coaching hires too, right? It's like maybe player development is going to be more of a core of what they are thinking and wanting to do. And if that's the case, then you maybe can start taking some risks on some guys with upside or guys that you think you can be able to coach up going forward. And that picking at the 21 and 22 spot gives you the overall chance to start kind of bringing that, bringing that sort of full circle, bring those guys into the fold So that you can, I don't know, this is why you brought these guys onto the staff to start getting into some of these and getting into and taking a project like a Gigi Jackson or some of these other guys on the list and saying to yourself, hey, look, no, we have the guys in the house that can that can do this. We have some professionals on the team as well. We can have ways to show them ropes and sort of mold their skills. And at that point, it's worth it for us to take maybe a moderate to maybe big risk at this part of the draft 
to sort of see how it's going. All right. Want to get a little bit more round out this conversation about what to expect with the Nets uh, when it comes to draft night. We will get into that in a second. Before we get to that, can I tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks? Each day during the NBA Finals, one lucky Prize Picks user is going to get a chance to win a million dollars. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern will be randomly selected each day. Whoever places is going to get a six pick flex on Prize Picks. Six correct picks, one million dollars. Five eighty thousand. Four correct picks, sixteen thousand. You have to go to PrizePicks.com/slash million. Got to opt in at that link to be eligible for the million dollar entry and get on this, folks. I mean, this, these finals might come to a close here. Once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal. You could be the lucky winner. Prize picks is daily fantasy made easy. You're just going more or less on the project on the prize picks projections. You're not going up against other players, it's just you versus prize picks. Pick two to six players, figure out if they're going to score more or less on that prize picks projections. You can win up to 25 times your money with the NBA. It's just more or less points, rebounds, steals, blocks, assists. You got an MFL coming back around PGA over the summer and really every other sport in between over on prize picks. Go to prize picks, uh, the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up to play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a hundred percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars with the promo code locked on. Uh, if you deposit a hundred prize picks, we'll give you a hundred and every other iteration in between. Don't forget to use the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100 prize picks is daily fantasy made easy all right rounding things out as we get into the draft uh going into next week uh i think we're gonna like i said at the beginning we're gonna start to have a clearer view maybe of what's happening some of these draft boards will start to get firmed up uh just in terms of notes i mean teams will start sort of signaling who it is that they're interested in taking i think we've already seen some of this with guys canceling you know, future workouts because they've been they the can the idea seems to be that they have already have a promise from a team. So they know they're going to get drafted in a certain spot. We're already seeing that kind of thing sort of start to play it its way out with the draft, but we're not all the way there. There's still plenty of time coming down the pike here for some of this stuff to work out um, just because this is just how it goes. I, will we see draft day trades? I don't know how much we're going to really see that. I, I think that I, I, that doesn't seem to be as big part of the narrative as had been maybe thought beforehand and there was like, you know, speculation that Portland would move its pick for the, you know, the three pick to sort of satisfy the Dame Lillard thing. It doesn't seem like that's the direction that they're going. There was thoughts that the Houston might move the four pick to sort of maybe make a better roster around James Harden. I'm not sure that that doesn't really seem to be playing itself out. So, you know, maybe people thought maybe the net, even the nets might package 21 and 22 together and move up in the draft. I don't think it doesn't seem like at least right now, that there's tons of appetite around a, the particular moves like that. So I'm not sure how much draft day wheeling and dealing we're going to see really across the whole NBA. Could be wrong about that. That's just me kind of speculating on it right now as it stands here. And again, these things are always sort of subject to change. Obviously, as with the NBA, we know this stuff just changes like daily. You know, all one day your favorite guy's playing with the team, and the next day it's like, yeah, Chris Paul's waved. That, that hasn't happened yet. But you know, we know that we're. Head, the NBA is al already pretty crazy in the landscape in terms of just like player movement and just, just sort of news and some, what makes, frankly, rooting for NBA just a lot of fun. It's kind of a year-round rooting process, So we and we know that things can change up to the last second. But it doesn't seem like there's tons and tons of buzz around any great draft sort of upheaval, at least right now with where some of these picks are going to go and where the nets are concerned. It doesn't, there's not a really a lot of talk in, in that scope either. Like it seems like they're going to stick with 21 and 22. We've talked about this many times on the podcast that it feels like they just have to try to get, try to trend younger where possible. There's been some dead zones for the nets when it comes to the draft. There hasn't been a ton of player development over the last few years in terms of like real rotational players who are still playing with the team. Yeah. Some of them got shipped off for the James Harden stuff when, you know, Karis LeVert and Jared Allen. So I, I get that some of that is because just like the way things sort of shook out in terms of trades or whatever, that you know, some of those guys ended up going um, and, and guys that they, you know, ended up, or excuse me, were drafting and developing, but if we're still like, we're kind of years away from that ha happening and there's none of those guys are on the roster now. And so, 
excuse me, there does seem to be a belief that the Nets, I think, and Adam and I both agree on this, the Nets just have to try to get younger whenever possible. When they have the picks now, which they do, they're not going to have them in some, some of them in future years from at least their own standpoint, even though they did recoup some a decent amount of draft capital back with the Durant trade and to some degree the Kyrie trade. They're getting some of this back in, but they don't not having their own picks is I think we're very much, especially with the way the cap's going to be coming and especially the way you know, free agency seems to be getting tougher and tougher and just things get expensive, getting cheaper guys and rookies on the books early. It's just important, man. Like when you're trying to develop a team, you just have to, at some point you have to nail some drafts. Like that's just kind of it. It's not rocket science. You just have to be able to do it. And when you take years off the draft because you were just focused on different things, which I, to some degree or to a lot of degree get with how the nets were operating, you are going to, you do start to end up paying the piper in terms of like what it's looking like on your roster. And then you maybe even have some guys on the roster that you drafted and you're not even that interested in playing. I lock Cam Thomas, you know, to some degree, Dayron Sharp. I mean, David Duke Jr. doesn't look like that's maybe going to totally happen. These guys were you know, to some degree lower picks. And Cam was not so low, right? Um, and maybe we see him play more. But like I said, in general, in terms of where the Nets have landed with the draft, this feels like multiple years where this just hasn't been, either they just haven't had the pick, they've shipped it off for uh, other players, or they just are, haven't been all that interested in playing that the guys they did draft. So I do think it's pretty important for them to, eh, to some degree nail this 21 and 22 bigger, at least one of them, right? Like have one of these guys work out from – guys that can actually be real rotational players for the team. I think this is a pretty important draft from that standpoint. Yeah, picking 21 and 22 means your hit rate's not always going to be super high. This isn't high lottery picks we're talking about. But with the draft, sometimes, especially in this range, it is about taking as many bites at the apple as you can get and hoping that you just kind of end up landing on a guy that can play. And we've seen plenty of guys drafted in this range over the years that just have been turned into NBA rotational guys. Like, so it's obviously not out of the realm of possibility for it to happen, but having a few more choice, sort of like a few more chances for it to happen makes sense. So I do like, you know, like if you just look back at the 21 draft, excuse me, last year's draft, the 2022 draft, guys that were taken in this 20 to 23, I'll just go 20 to 23 range. I mean, Spurs took Mal Malachi Brandon. He ended up playing real rotation minutes for them at the end of the year. Nuggets at 21 drafted Christian Brown. Like we've already seen he's been playing like real critical rotational minutes for the Nuggets in the in, in these finals and had sort of like almost game winning performance in game three. So hey, 21 can really matter. The Grizzlies who ended up trade shipping this off ended up being a Minnesota pick took Walker Kessler, who ended up being in the Rudy Gobert trade. That guy was awesome this year, right? Like, he dropped all the way to 22, and he was phenomenal, like, like an all-rookie guy uh, when he ended up getting real minutes with the Jazz. So, yeah, 21 – the the 21 spot can wield, yield, real, yeah, wield real guys. I got there. Uh, in terms of NBA talent, right out of the box. Again, those that was just last year's draft. Those guys played a lot this season and were really, really important for their teams. So – you know, saying to yourself, hey, we're in the 21, 22 range. This is what the Nets can get. These are the kind of guys that they're targeting. This is something we really, really want to keep an eye on as we go sort of into the draft. It's like the belief has to be that these guys can land. So just to sum it up, where the mocks are ending up ending up with where the Nets are, like I said, Jet Howard is the is the most mock guy to the Nets. Gigi Jackson is number two. Noah Clowney is the third most guy. Uh, tied for this next group of guys, Derek Whitehead, Bryce Sensabaugh, Ryan Repair. Those guys are in that next group. And then the next group down from that, Maxwell Lewis, Kobe Buff Buffkin featured a couple times, Ben Shepard featured a couple times, and then Jalen Hood, Leonard Miller, Chris Murray. Uh, that's the group that ends up being mocked. As we get into next week, as we get closer to the draft, we'll roll through this exercise one more time just to see if it's changed at all, which I'm sure it will. These mock drafts change all the time with new information, so I'm sure we're going to get sort of a different lay of the land, which is cool. Again, this is a really, really exciting time for the Nets, really exciting time for the NBA in general. As we get closer, we'll kind of take a look at what to expect, and, we'll, and I think that we should start kind of telling ourselves as Nets folks a story here that says – I think we're probably looking at a scenario with the Nets, which would make the most sense. We take one sort of safer pick and maybe one upside pick, and that's the gift of having these picks back-to-back -back in the NBA draft. All right. 
Got an exciting week of just special guests coming down the pike here. Going to be talking more just possible trade stuff. We got some special guests coming on. Adam and I will go back into the draft stuff just to break down a few more guys that we wanted to cover that could land in this Nets range as well. So a lot coming down the pike this week. Make sure you are subscribed to Locked on Nets over on YouTube. We're pushing towards 6,000 subscribers over there. Would love to get there uh, before the beginning of the season. I mean, I think we'll definitely get there before the season. If we want to pile on a bunch of uh, subs here in the next couple of weeks, get the 6,000 before the draft, I'm all for that. Maybe free agency as well. Make sure you are subscribed to Locked On Nets over on YouTube. We always get to this part of this podcast where Adam reminds us of the all time great poets. And I, once again, I always forget to dial up the quote until we get to this point. So I'll just say Adam Armbrecht, one of the all time great poets. We will be back again tomorrow talking more Brooklyn Nets basketball.